Kara Bernstein, and we're here at the CMO and Retail Assembly in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm here with our keynote speaker, Keith Reinhardt. He is the Chairman Emeritus at DDB Worldwide. Thank you so much for being here. You're welcome. Thank you, Kara. So attendees walk into our assembly and your books are displayed all over. So tell us a little bit about Any Wednesday, how it came about, <laughs> how you even thought of this idea. Tell us about it. <laughs> uh, 1986, we had offices all over the world and uh, it's hard for uh, a leader of an agency that big to be everywhere and to be a presence. And it seemed to me that maybe, and this was before email, so it seemed to me maybe once a week on a Wednesday, people would enjoy getting a word of optimism or maybe some good news about an, a client we'd won or a great campaign that uh, had been created. And so I, I decided to write a one-pager every Wednesday, but I called it any Wednesday so that I wouldn't have to do it every Wednesday. <laughs> but then I realized if I didn't do it every Wednesday, I wouldn't do it at all. I would, so, the, so the discipline of doing it every week was uh, important. And I wrote them on uh, yellow lined paper, but with the words going across the rules, across the lines. Okay. There was a Spanish uh, philosopher who said, if they, give you the, if they give you lined paper, write the other way. And I thought this was a great uh, visualization of what we're supposed to do, break patterns. Risen, uh, rules are prisons, and we need to break the pattern. And so every, uh, Every Sunday night, I would finish it, <clears throat> give it to my assistant to type up, and uh, send out faxes to all the uh, <laughs> outlying. Faxes, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> yeah, remember faxes? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it became, uh, it became a tradition, and people looked forward to it. Right. And so a few years ago, somebody said, why don't you take some of those that are timeless, that are still relevant, and put them into a book? So I did that, and uh, I chose uh, 104, that's two years mm. worth of Wednesdays, and uh, tried to pick some that still have uh, relevance and are still timely. So that's how it came about, and it's doing pretty well. I sold three this morning on <laughs> <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> so. And many are being sold here. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank well, that's you. great. That, that's so interesting. I'm looking forward to reading it. So there's obviously a lot of transformation going on in the industry right now, um, especially digital. So I'm, I'm curious to hear your opinion on this. Um, is this distraction? Are these shiny new <laughs> objects? Wh wh what is this? Are, are brands truly connecting with consumers because of this? Well, that's a, a very good question, a very broad one. Right. Um, the advertising industry, uh, as I knew it and really got attracted to it, began really in the 50s uh, with Bill Burnback, who broke all the rules. And, uh, and that was the, called the creative revolution. And uh, then we learned to engage people with wit and irony and uh, stories and craft. And then at the end of the century came the digital disruption, boom. Yep. And di <laughs> digital messiahs predicted that we were dinosaurs, We'd, we would not survive this uh, digital disruption. And uh, we had so many new tools given to us. Uh, we did things that just because we could, mm -hmm. not because we should. And we became preoccupied with the tools. Um, I started uh, quoting an American philosopher uh, whose name I've just forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come to who, you at the end of the interview. <laughs> who, who said, I fear, at the end of another century, who said, I fear that men have become tools of their tools. Mm. And I thought we were focusing too much on the tools and losing sight of some of the basics of brand building and storytelling. And so I started referring to this period as the digital distraction. Mm. We were being distracted from um, the basics of uh, connecting emotionally uh, with uh, uh, an enduring brand story that uh, has integrity across all communications channels. Um, a, a, a high purpose for a brand. What, what does the brand stand for? And we were, I think, losing sight of those uh, basics. And now I think we're, we're coming into, or we have come into, a much more promising period. We've sort of gotten used to the tsunami of technology, a new device every day. 
And also technology has advanced so that we can go back to uh, even long form storytelling on YouTube and other uh, platforms. So now we're in what I'm calling the uh, ultimate revelation where uh, what will be revealed, among other things, um, there's a big difference between creating a buzz and creating a brand. Okay. There's a difference between um, an algorithm and a true insight into human nature. There's a big difference between a one-off stunt and an enduring brand story that has consistency over time. There's a difference between um, a click and a true c emotion, connection mm -hmm. uh, of emotion, and a big difference between big data and a big idea. So I think now we can take the lessons we learned in the creative revolution about storytelling and about craft and about engaging people with humor and combine those lessons with the amazing tools we were given in the digital disruption and uh, come up with the best of all worlds. A couple of other things that will be revealed in the ultimate revelation. We used to have the media and the creative together in one agency. In the 80s, that was torn apart. Um, that really hurt the process. And now we're starting to see uh, reintegration. It's taking different forms, but we're starting to see the media strategy needs to be a part of creative strategy. They need to work together, and that's coming back. And uh, another thing that will be revealed is that native advertising doesn't work, uh, just like advertorials didn't work back in the day because it breaches both the integrity of the media and the integrity of the brand. People are being deceived, or they're, the attempt is to deceive them into thinking that this is really a media story when it's really an ad. So anyway, so it's an interesting time. Yeah. It should be interesting to see it what, what, how it all plays well, out. I'm still trying to figure it out. It's fun, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what can brands do if they've really lost sight of their original message due to all of these distractions that you're talking about now? How, how can you go back to the basics? Well, I think they can, uh, they can relaunch a brand and, and say, uh, okay, um, what is our brand concept? What does it stand for? And my experience, the strong, enduring brands have all had three elements in combination. Um, and you can lead with uh, any one of the three, but all three are necessary to be present. First is a point of view. What's, what's our point of view about why we exist, why we're on the planet? Do we have a higher purpose? Um, out of that point of view comes a promise, either expli uh, explicit or implicit. And then those two are clothed in a uh, distinctive and attractive personality. So you have those three Ps. And um, so that every touch point, consumer touch point, through every channel, those ought to be present. It ought to have a consistent personality across all of those channels. The promise ought to be there, and the point of view should be there. And the point of view now, uh, especially with this generation, is becoming more and more important. Higher purpose. Uh, what, is, what are we doing to elevate society in addition to uh, sell stuff? So going... What brands can do now is go back and say, okay, what is our point of view? And is that expressed across all touch points? What are we promising? And what is our personality? I think you can, you can think in the, in the world of brands, Nike has had a very consistent brand over time. And uh, their point of view is that there, there is athletic uh, achievement within every person. And their promise is we will inspire and enable this ability. And their personality has always been very athletic. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of present across yeah. all the touch points. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so brands can go back and say, OK, what are those three Ps? And are they, are they being consistently uh, executed? Uh, that's one thing they can do. Uh, the other thing they can do, another thing they can do is uh, really challenge how many channels we need. Uh, just because they're there, they're there, doesn't mean <laughs> that we have to be on them. Right. And uh, you know, uh, 
some big brands have uh, said, you know, we tried digital and we're still going to use a little, but we're going back to radio. Uh, and, and maybe simplify this whole process a little bit. As I said, just because they're there doesn't mean we have to use them all. So I think that would be another thing they could do is challenge. Makes sense. You can get very caught up in everything that's happening right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you deserve a break today. You, everyone yeah. wants to know the answer to this. Uh, where did this fantastic idea for this ca campaign fr come from? <laughs> uh, it was 1970. And, um, you know, McDonald's didn't even have restaurants across the country. Mm. But Ray Kroc, the founder, wanted a national ad campaign so that people would get excited about McDonald's so that when he put a store in their town, they would all line up. Yeah. And, and so the first national campaign was our assignment. And um, so we did a lot of research, and we found that people wanted to escape from their daily routines. Uh, back then, women were known as housewives, yeah. and they wanted to escape from the daily routine of meal planning. Okay. And dads, who would like to take their family out to dinner, wanted to escape from high prices, and kids wanted to escape from broccoli and table <laughs> manners and all those things. So. Our research said that if we, if we come up with an escape plan for all these people mm -hmm. and present model, uh, McDonald's as, as, the, as the, the place to escape to, that could be oh. very, very potent, very wow. powerful. So we came up with this campaign, and thank God it didn't run. I mean, it, <laughs> it, it, it might have been a good promotion campaign, but it would not have been a long-running campaign, and it certainly wouldn't have been as classic as you deserve a break today. So we came, our first campaign was come to the McDonald's Islands. Oh. I mean, these are islands. <laughs> you can escape to a McDonald's. You can escape from your meal planning. You can escape from your routine, yeah. and the kids can escape from their table manners. <laughs> come to the McDonald's Islands and you can almost write the rest of it. You know, the, the food on these islands are fantastic. fantastic. The, the natives are so friendly and you, you can see where that goes. So we're in Hollywood, <clears throat> second day of shooting, come to the McDonald's Islands and we get a call from McDonald's legal saying you can't use that. There's a chain of root beer stands somewhere in Nebraska <laughs> that refers to their outlets as uh, islands of pleasure. So you, can't, so you can't use that. There we are with a day's worth of shooting in the can, and we have no campaign. So I'm in California. I call New York, two music writers, and I said, we, we, we've got some air dates and we have no campaign. And <clears throat> on the plane, trying to think about what we could do to start writing music to, and uh, so Getaway was still good. Uh, Get away to McDonald's was good. And so we started writing music to uh, get up and get away to McDonald's. <laughs> Makes sense. And, <laughs> and we had to precede it because we had a great tune, a show tune sort of. And so we had to write a lead line into So Get Up and Get Away. And so we wrote, we're so near yet far away, so get up and get away. Makes Ooh, sense, right? We're yeah. very close by huh? geographically, far away right. uh, philosophically. And we take it to McDonald's, and they love the feeling. They love the whole idea. And they say, what do they say in, at, at the end? You know, we're so near yet far away. Yeah. And we try and explain it. And they say, we don't like that. <laughs> so now we have seven notes uh, to fill. And we go back <laughs> into the research. Oh, no. and, and we see that, that women have used the word break quite a bit. So the job now becomes which note gets the word break and what are the other words that go there and typing away, trying all these combinations. You deserve a break today. <laughs> yes. And I called the musician in New York and I said, yes, I think we've got it. And uh, he said, uh, you deserve a break today. He said, I don't think that's singable. And <laughs> I said to him, if you don't sing it, I'll find somebody else to sing it. And that was the birth of you deserve wow. a break today. So sometimes Creativity is, the, uh, is an act of inspiration. Uh, sometimes it's desperation. Right. 
and this was depra desperation. But it worked. <laughs> it worked. It turned out okay. Yeah. That's a great story. And yeah, Advertising Age said it was the number one jingle of the century. So I guess you did something right. So, right. <laughs> so if you had to name one marketing industry trend in the past, present, and what you think for the future, what, what would you name it as? So what was one of the biggest trends in the past that is now different? Well, we don't like to think about trends. Mm. We'd, we'd rather create a trend if we could. Uh -huh. Because a, a, a trend, if you jump on a trend, you're imitating. Mm. And imitation is really suicide, I think, in, in creativity. Oh. Yeah. So uh, we don't bother so much with yeah. trends. I think when the uh, one can uh, say that the uh, uh, days uh, predating Bill Burnback, there were there were rules that people uh, embraced, and they became trends. Mm -hmm. Like Ross Reeves said, every brand has to have a unique selling proposition, uh -huh. and and we have to uh, mindlessly repeat that selling proposition so that it goes into their head, and they mm -hmm. and they can't sleep without thinking about it. it, it it's crazy. Yeah. So I guess that was a trend of uh, sort of scientific uh, advertising. Okay. And then Burnback started a trend of breaking the pattern. And, and other agencies said, hey, this is cool. And agencies like Goodby and uh, Wyden Kennedy, uh, John Hegarty in the UK, others said, this is good. We engage the consumer's uh, intelligence and uh, engage them with humor and irony and uh, an emotional connection. So that, that, I guess, was a trend. Yeah. And then the digital disruption hit us, and everything, <laughs> that was a trend. Yeah. The, 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 the age of traditional advertising has ended, mm -hmm. and it's all going to be digital. Yeah. Of course, the great breakthrough was the internet, which allowed us to physically or literally engage mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. uh, and have two-way dialogues. And then Burnback said, word of mouth is the best medium of all. Now we had word of web. Mm -hmm. So we could not only have a dialogue with the customer, but if we did it right, we could have the, um, the customer uh, have dialogue with her or his network, and we could have a community for the brand. Yeah. So that was obviously and yeah. that was a, a good trend. I mean, everybody jumped on that one. Yep. <laughs> um, now, uh, I'm not sure. I, I, I'd like to think that we're, we're starting a, uh, to see uh, more storytelling again. Yeah. We know that there's never been a way invented in human history better than a story. Yeah. I mean, we can look at hieroglyphics, and we can look at cave paintings on the walls, and, and uh, stories are the most powerful way to connect with people. Mm -hmm. And if I tell you a story uh, in a commercial, you can repeat it to your friends. If I just flash a bunch of images and, and with some music, you can say, well, I saw this commercial that flashed up. But a story, you can repeat. Yeah. So I think we're going to see more of that. I hope that's a trend. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're so excited you're here as our keynote speaker at our assembly. And I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on What's the benefit of attending a nice, small, intimate program uh, with C-suite executives to really be able to gauge in peer-to-peer -peer learning? Well, I always learn something. I mean, you know, <laughs> you're, you're never too old to, to learn. Yeah. Gandhi said, learn as if you'll live forever. Um, and so uh, I'm always interested in uh, learning from attendees. And, you know, networking is, is really important. Uh, one of the mistakes I made, one of many in my <laughs> long oh. career, <laughs> I, <clears throat> in the beginning, I, I never knew the value of networking. Mm. I, I, I grew up in a very provincial, conservative community where you just mind your own business and you do your thing, and uh, it was a furniture-making town, and you, you do your job, and you're a great craftsman, yeah. don't worry about anybody else. It was only later when I got into the business world I realized how important it is mm -hmm. to have a network, to create a network and, uh, and embrace a network. So that's one value of these kinds of conferences and, and uh, networking. But I think 
the key value for me is I, I always come away having learned something that I had never thought of before. So I'm anxious to do that. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for joining us. You're welcome. My pleasure.